Ladies and gentlemen, again, pleasure to be before you. Brother Neubauer seems to forget that Abraham was the man of faith. Now, I appreciate being compared to Abraham. And so uh, he didn't intend it that way, but that's good company to be with. On uh, He talks about an inclusio uh, argument. He says that's what it is. He has to go out of the uh, Bible, by the way, to find that terminology. And he has to derive it from a study of the rabbis and things of that nature rather than from Jesus Christ, the apostles, and the New Testament itself. Further, he said the uh, other night concerning the matter of uh, Jonah and Jesus, that Jesus was the sign. That's simply not so. The sign was Jonah being three days and, and three nights in the belly of the great fish, which signaled the, uh, was the sign of Jesus' resurrection. And that was the sign that Jesus himself gave. Uh, he seems to have that turned around. Then the, he says, well, faithful, uh, you have to obey. That's the condition. Well, look, we dealt with that. A faithful Christian is one who obeys, does he not? Faithful child of God. And we demonstrated on the basis of the aorist and decadence that it must be the case. It must be the case. That he's admitted, in view of the fact he's admitted, that spiritual death was not destroyed unconditionally. And he's admitted that uh, spiritual death was not destroyed conditionally on the basis of one simply being a Christian. And we demonstrate it by virtue of the fact that uh, spiritual death was not uh, 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 destroyed. Uh, on the basis of, uh, uh, on the condition of being obedient or being a faithful Christian in A.D. 70 because it had already been destroyed in that sense prior to A.D. 70. And therefore, with those three options removed, he, have, he does not have spiritual death in A.D. 70. It's not destroyed in A.D. 70. The passage he went to in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 12, by the way, universally is cited by theologian after theologian, commentator after commentator, Greek scholar after Greek scholar, as an example in reference to the first coming of Christ, to what he accomplished by virtue of his death on the cross. In fact, he ignored a temporal marker. You know, he kept talking about we need to pay attention to time reference. Notice what uh, this passage says. It has now, what? It has now been revealed by the appearing of our Lord, uh, of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Not it will be, but it has now. And that marks the time. Come down. A few verses later, when did this happen? Now at His appearing. Now this is the condition of things. He seems to have a problem with time. I don't know. Now notice something else. He got to talking about gematria. By the way, where is the word gematria in the Bible? He says it's a case of gematria. He asserts that. Most of the commentators that I read, uh, including many who hold to the A.D. 70 position for the book, most of those say it could be a case of Gematria. So he's asserting that he knows it is. On what basis? The Scriptures don't say it is. He has to go out of the Scriptures and try to find something that supposedly fits. It's not mentioned in the Bible. And he talked about baloney. That's baloney. Uh, he's the one that's butchering the scriptures, and uh, he should go to work for Oscar Mayer. He'd have a good job there. So death was not destroyed spiritually. That just won't hold up. And by the way, you may reference Brother Wallace and Brother Camp. On no, a number of occasions, I heard both those men refer to the King Doctrine, and this was before Max King went off into, into Universalism. They called the eight, the A.D. 70 doctrine that the second coming of Christ came in A.D. 70 heresy. 
And I stand with them on it. I knew Brother Camp personally. I knew Brother Wallace. And I knew their, I knew the uh, some uh, of uh, Brother Camp's family. Brother Winfred Clark was a friend. And Brother Clark held the same view as his uncle. And Brother Clark on numerous occasions denounced Brother King's doctrine. He denounced Don Preston's doctrine. And he would denounce yours if he were here. And so would the other two men. You, you sully their names when you uh, misuse and characterize them as being in agreement and in your camp. You ought to know better than that. That is not right. They're not here to speak for themselves. And you misuse them in order to uh, promote your doctrine. That's not right. That is not right. Come back to Romans 7. Your chart, the chart of Brother Scott Clapp, teaches that you are dead, you're buried in the water, and then what happens? You're raised up. Now, according to what he just said, that's A.D. 70. So, if that's the case, you folks who think you were baptized, you weren't. The resurrection's past. You're 1,900 years too late. This has ended. You can't have it both ways. That was the point. The grammar will not allow it. That's what I was saying about syntax. He seems to think that syntax is something they put on cigarettes rather than the structure of the Bible, the Word of God. He wound up teaching a form of proxy baptism. That was a strange exposition to say the least in 1 Corinthians 15. He accused us of displacement theology and uh, yet the Bible talks about the kingdom being taken from you and given to a nation that is the church bringing forth the fruits thereof, does it not? Doesn't the Bible say that? Hmm, sounds like some sort of replacement to me, at least concerning the kingdom. Then, keep this in mind, he, uh, concerning uh, Gematria and all of these speculations such as this, this seems like spiritual core math. That's what it strikes me as. You just make it up as you go along and uh, as long as it fits with what he wants. Another thing. He made such a big to-do over my pointing out that his doctrine saying that marriage did not begin, the marriage did not begin till A.D. 70, that he was implying, that uh, he was implying by his doctrine that Christ and the church were having children out of wedlock. And he saw oh, the, and he really uh, ragged on me concerning that. And then he turns right around and he says, my doctrine implies that uh, the father wound up getting the bride. I didn't say that. I didn't even imply that. I said, the father signed the covenant. The Father made the covenant. Jesus Himself taught that what He taught were the words from whom? The Father. The New Testament came from the Father. Jesus ratified it with His blood. And then Jesus married the church. So that on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, the church came into existence. They even admit that. The church, the bride of Christ, came into existence on the day of Pentecost. Those who obeyed were added to what? They were in Christ, were they not? He admitted that. Ephesians 1 3, Ephesians 1 7. And I dealt with those passages, by the way. And he talks about being in Christ, therefore, they're in the church. Now, he fusses about the matter of the. Uh, body, about the body being the re, uh, uh, purchased uh, 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 item here in Romans chapter 8. Now think about this. What are they redeemed from? What are they purchased from? What, are the, what is the physical body being? It's being redeemed from the grave. It's being raised up by the power of God and instantly transported, transferred 
and changed into a spiritual, glorified, and immortal body. That's the redemption that's under consideration there. They're brought out uh, of their grave. They're redeemed from the grave. And indeed, I look forward to that. Maybe you don't. Obviously you don't. But I do. I look forward to seeing Him even as He is. What did He say about that? What has He done with those five arguments on the, res on the resurrection? What did He do? He hasn't called for a single chart throughout this entire debate. Not one. Not one. We have presented argument after argument after argument. Six in very formal structure. And he hasn't dealt with any one of them. In fact, he completely ignored the previous argument made in the, my second negative. Now, think about some of the other things that we've dealt with. What did he say about nous in, he, in uh, Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2? What did he say about that, this last speech? I pointed out that naos is used in, the, in that uh, section of Scripture with the article. It's there. You can look it up. Look it up. It's in the Scriptures. It's in the Greek. You kept telling me to look stuff up. Why don't you take your own advice? Again, he makes rules for others that he doesn't apply to himself. The article is there. And it's also used in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21, by his own hermeneutical law. In his own hermeneutical law, it must be the case that the naas is the church. He can't escape that. He has to deny the rule he himself created, and uh, he can't do that. We also have uh, dealt with Daniel 12. We showed the historical context and all he could do was say, throw away your history books. And you know what? He even mentioned Antiochus Epiphanes himself. Where did he get that? Huh? Where did he get that to try to make a quibble to get around it using Antiochus? He had to appeal to a history book, didn't he? He had to go out of the Bible in order to try to answer and he's already admitted he has a number of books in his library, including Flavius Josephus. While he tells you to throw away yours, he'll keep his and use it as he chooses to. Now, again, Revelation 11. The Gentiles trample, according to his doctrine, the temple. That's not what the passage says. The passage says that the naas is sealed. It's protected. And so are the worshipers therein. Talking about the faithful. Concerning the destruction of Jerusalem, the priests were killed. The temple was burned down. Burned to the ground. He admits that. That doesn't fit that passage. Again, he literalizes where he wants figurizes where he thinks it works for him. We pointed out that uh, if the Bible teaches the fact that the, the world will end, that the universe will come to an end, that that implies the end of time. And what did he say about that? Not, nothing. He had been fussing about the phrase, the end of time! is not in the Bible. Then he turns around and admits that it would be a scriptural expression if my doctrine is true. So he's got a problem that way. He has hedged. He has dodged. He has ignored arguments. He's misrepresented my case and misrepresented other people. He's caviled, carped, equivocated, caught himself in, in numerous self-contradictions. He's quibbled. He's uh, committed all sorts of uh, logical fallacies. That's what his case is made up. That's how it consists. Now that's not argumentation, brethren. That's evasion. Now, think about a few other matters 
re relative to uh, this particular doctrine. Uh, I want you to, again, bring up the uh, questions for Friday. Bring up the questions for Friday. Thank you. Uh, that's my question. There we are. Number three. Romans 1.16 is applicable to accountable persons today, including Holger Neubauer. You just uh, you admitted that it's applicable. You admitted that we're bound by it. And you, you stood up here and ridiculed me, saying I have the obligation to go to the synagogue. Well, you have the same obligation too. Again, you made a rule that you don't apply to yourself. You don't apply. You see, he understood when we asked that question, he knew that what was going to happen in verse 17, he'd have to give it up. If, it doesn't, if verse 16 doesn't apply today, verse 17 doesn't either. Because verse 17 is the foundation of verse 16. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith unto faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Maybe that's why he has a problem with Abraham. I don't know. He doesn't like the idea of faith. Now look at this. As I said, he implied that if the Bible implicitly taught the end of time, implicitly taught it, then it'd be right to use the phrase. Contradiction again. Here we got, Paul, he said Paul was obligated to continue to observe all the law of Moses in all respects until he died. You talk about mass confusion. That's what we've got over here. It's mass confusion with their doctrine. They have Paul partially, halfway so to speak, obligated to keep the law of Moses, while at the same time obligated to keep the law of Christ. They have him married, at least in some sense, to some degree, to Jesus Christ, and yet married to some degree, in some way, to the law of Moses. That's where he is. That's an absurdity. It's a self-contradiction again. And it involves a form of spiritual adultery. And he can deny that all he wants. He can find, he can take umbrage with it. But that's the implication of his doctrine. It's a horrible doctrine. And it is a terrible doctrine. And Brother Wallace and Brother uh, Camp were correct when they said that this doctrine is a doctrine that is heretical. By the way, do you know that before they introduced their doctrine, we had a very good relationship. In fact, they contacted me concerning marriage, divorce, and remarriage issues. Now, he brought up this matter of me calling them heretics. They were the ones that introduced the doctrine. They claimed it was a matter of opinion. Well, if it was a matter of opinion, why did you push it? Why is it being pushed to the division of the brotherhood? If it's a matter of opinion, they should have left it alone and allowed things to continue and the peace to continue. It's when they started pushing this doctrine that they were called heretics. You know why? The word heretic indicates makers of schism, schism. They caused the division. They split the law by driving the wedge. If it's a matter of opinion, they should have set the doctrine aside in order to hold the other brethren. No, this has become their golden calf. This is what they're pushing to the dividing of churches. And they're dividing churches uh, in a variety of places, as he just indicated. And he's proud of that. He's proud of the division. He's proud of the schisms he's creating and bragging about it. Brethren, that's not the spirit of Christ. If it were a matter of opinion, they ought to set it aside and plead for the blood of Christ to cleanse those who have caused this error on their part. I have no animus toward these brethren. I desire their repentance. I desire their salvation. But they are the ones, as the old preachers used to say, who split the log. And you split it 
by driving the wedge. And the wedge is their doctrine. 